Lewis was our oldest child. We have two children. He was really a, a live wire. He was a very lively boy. He was also quite brilliant. I mean, he was one of the most highly intelligent people I've ever known. And he learned a lot. He knew a lot of things, more than, far more than most adults. So he had this sort of wide and varied knowledge. And he also had a wicked sense of humor. So he was, um, so other children really enjoyed him. He was just a fun kid. He had a condition called pectus excavatum, which is um, a condition in which the breastbone doesn't really grow straight. It's just, it's a cosmetic condition. We saw an article in um, our local newspaper talking about this safe, minimally invasive new surgery. And we ended up taking our son for pectus surgery. And Lewis came out of surgery and we thought, Phew, we've made it through that. About three days after surgery, he suddenly had this excruciating pain in his upper abdomen. He was prescribed a, a, a drug called Ketorolac Tordol, which is um, an insane pain reliever, like aspirin. He developed a perforated ulcer because he wasn't properly hydrated at the same time. And no one noticed he declined for 30 hours and they dismissed it as uh, constipation. By the next morning, he had no blood pressure. He had um, sky high pulse rate. He lost 2.8 liters of blood. And for a child his size, I think he had had about four liters altogether. You know, I watched the the color drain out of his lips. It was just like water going down in a glass. And they turn the same color as his skin. Just all the all the pink left his lips. It's it's really hard to even imagine seeing something like that. And then he, you know, he, he said to me, it's, it's going black, and he, he went into cardiac arrest. Yeah, I ran out of the room. I thought he was having a seizure. I ran out of the room looking for help. These young residents and nurses were just astonished, and they worked on him for about an hour and a half before they gave up but uh, they never could bring him around. Losing Lewis has been devastating. I started Mothers Against Medical Error. When we came back from, from the hospital, the first thing we did was the legislation, the Lewis Blackman Act. So one of the things that we have tried to work on is you know, full disclosure informed consent, transparency, badges, labeling of people because we had been misled about who was a resident and who was a doctor, and rapid response having an emergency number for people to call and allowing people to call their doctors as well. So those were four things that had come directly from our case that, um, you know, that we had seen that we thought we could fix with legislation. Lewis was monitored, but it kept alarming and they would keep setting it lower and lower. And finally they had it down at 85 and he, it still kept alarming, so they turned it off. Every patient deserves continuous monitoring. You, you never know what's going to happen, particularly with post-operative patients. Um, Lewis is a prime example. He was a perfectly healthy child, which is why no one believed that he could possibly have anything wrong with him. So you need a, um, an objective observer like a monitor.
Please welcome Dr. Sanaz Masumi. I can tell you that it does not get any easier no matter how many times you watch these videos. It never gets easier. But let me introduce someone this morning um, that has brought many, many lives to this world. Our next keynote speaker is a renowned public health leader, California's second Surgeon General and the first Latina Surgeon General. She is the leading spokesperson on the most pressing public health issues of the time within the state of the California. Raised in South Central Los Angeles, she received her medical degree from Keck School of Medicine of the University of Southern California. She went on completing her residency and training in obstetrics and gynecology at LAC USC Medical Center. She also holds a Master of Public Health degree from UCLA School of Public Health and a Master of Business Administration degree from UC Irvine Paul Mirage School of Business. Please welcome Dr. Diana Ramos, California Surgeon General. Thank you so much, everyone. Can you hear me okay? So I don't know how I can follow that video, and it is heart-wrenching. And I can tell you as a physician who has taken care of patients under many dire circumstances, um, sometimes you, it, it, it never gets easy. It never gets easy, and um, oftentimes I would be on call on Friday night, on Friday nights, Saturday nights, and we would have near death cases on labor and delivery. And I would tell my family, I've got to go to church this morning because I have to give thanks for the fact that this patient made it through the night. So it, it really doesn't get any easier. And I don't know, the slides are not advancing. Okay. So I want to start out with a little bit of background about myself and how my role now really is informing the work that we're doing at the state, but more importantly, the work that you're striving to do with patients. And the one thing that I can tell you that as an OBGYN, I've had firsthand experience not only in caring for patients, but I've been on the ground and have been part of the development of toolkits that have been used in California for improving the maternal outcomes um, here, not only in California, but that have been implemented throughout the world. One of those, the, the most common one is the hemorrhage. That was one of the first ones. And there are many times that I can tell you when patients would say, well, what can I do to prepare for um, the delivery? And many times there was anemia. And just to say, well, you can take some iron, have an iron-rich diet. But that's when the patients were able to come and see me. Because there were many times when patients could not come to their prenatal care appointment because they didn't have the transportation or they didn't have the babysitter or they missed the bus in order to come see me. So these are the social determinants of health that we sometimes overlook and have to keep in mind when we're caring for people. So I know this is a technology conference also, and you're looking for technology solutions. I would challenge you, keep in mind, what can we develop one step further in order to meet these social determinants of health? Because it could be that that social determinant of health, the fact that it's a decision between, should I buy the iron? Should I buy the prenatal vitamin? Should I buy my high blood pressure medicine? Or should I eat? is really the decision that's gonna set you off for a, a, a different trajectory outcome. So it's critically important that we can't forget the social determinants of health. 80% of health happens outside of the healthcare setting, 80%. So as much as we think that we have control in our health environments, we've gotta remember what is happening outside, in the homes, in the environments that our, our patients are living in. So keep that in mind. So I bring all of those experience, having cared for patients in East Los Angeles, having cared for patients in third world countries, to here, to all of you, to say, 
you know, this is a realization. Don't forget the social determinants of health. And I know many times people say, well, technology, not everyone has access to it. Not everyone does, but everyone does have, uh, know somebody that may have access to technology. So we have libraries, there are programs that connect folks, low income folks to uh, free cell phones, text messaging. You can be very innovative. I know I'm in a room full of innovators and leaders come up with innovative solutions. Let's see. The next slide is going to highlight the initiatives that we're focusing on in our office. So we are here to address something that is happening in our facilities, the patient safety piece. I want you to think one step back. I want you to think, what can we do to actually help prevent a condition that is going to require somebody to be in the healthcare facility that perhaps may increase their risk for death? What are the upstream approaches? What can prevent a health condition? And one of those things is addressing the adverse childhood experiences. So some of you may have heard of adverse childhood experiences. Uh, for those of you who haven't, it's the label that we create for the things that happen in our lives when we're less than 18 years old. And that's abuse, that could be physical, emotional, it could be neglect, and it could be household disruption. So examples of household disruption would be there's divorce, there's mental health issues, there's substance abuse, or there's somebody incarcerated in the family. So all of these things, the more of these experiences we have, the higher likelihood for us to be on a chronic health, negative health trajectory. So if you were to address the adverse childhood experiences before the age of 18, you have a 44% chance of preventing depression. Preventing, we're not even talking about treating, we're not even talking about curing, we're talking about prevention. 24% chance of decreasing asthma, 34% chance of decreasing smoking, 24% chance of decreasing alcoholism. And you may be thinking, well, how can that be? And I know when I teach medical students, they ask that question. The reason being is that when we are stressed, when there are bad things happening in our lives, what do we do? We try to feel better. And some of those ways that we feel better is by self-medicating, and that could be food, that could be drugs, that could be tobacco, that could be you know, risky behaviors. And that's why we can actually prevent all of those, that negative uh, chronic trajectory. This is a picture that was, I'm borrowed from Dr. Vincent Folletti. Dr. Vincent Folletti is one of the lead researchers on adverse childhood experiences. He did the research in, in 1997 when he was at Kaiser Permanente in San Diego. He had a weight loss clinic. He was a preventive medicine physician, along as a, uh, an internist as well. And so this is a picture of one of the patients that he saw. He said, Diana, I would see patients every week wanting to come in to lose weight. And they would be successful. And they would lose the weight. This was a 27-year-old. 52 weeks later, then she lost the weight. But she said, what, what, what he said, what would happen is that she would then gain the weight again within six months. He kept on seeing this happening over and over and over again. Finally, he asked, is there something that you want to share as to why you're gaining back the weight? And they said, yes. The weight actually protected me. When I was eight years old, I was sexually abused by my father. My father would tell me, you're beautiful, you're thin, and he would abuse me. He saw this over and over. So it was the fact that all of that bad stuff, the abuse that was happening in the person's life that caused them to have all of that negative health trajectory. So we talk about prevention. This is an upstream approach. So we have been invested. Our office is codified to address the adverse childhood experiences. So now you think about, well, what about an adult? What, what's going to happen to me now? <laughs> I know when I was learning about this, I thought, what am I going to do now? 
Well, what you're going to do is one, you now know about it, and two, just realize that sometimes we're experiencing and our health is a reflective of what happened as a result when we were younger. But more importantly, we can be a positive influence, a positive force in kids, in children less than 18 years old, because we know that the more positive people there are, the more supportive people there are in children's lives, this actually helps mitigate any adverse childhood experiences. So having grown up in South Central, having been raised by a single mom, um, really very low income, um, I'm here. I'm here, and you may ask yourself, well, how could she be here if she had all that bad stuff? It's those positive experiences, the positive people in my life. So choose to be those positive people in children's lives. And finally, the other piece that we're focusing on and we're getting ready to launch is Strong Start and Beyond. So if you click on the QR code, which I encourage everyone to do so, I need your partnership. So along with September 17th being the Patient Safety Day, it also is the day that we are launching Strong Start and Beyond. Strong Start and Beyond is the movement that we are committed to here in California, and we're launching on um, the 17th to decrease maternal mortality and morbidity. And you may be thinking, well, why are you just focusing on maternal mortality? Well, the fact that 52% of the population are women, the fact that 48% um, of the population's babies being born are Hispanic, and more importantly, the fact that we can actually prevent 89% of maternal deaths in California, that's why we're focusing on moms. So it's critically important. On this day, we're gonna announce big audacious goals. And I have no doubt that when you hear that goal, you're gonna say, how can they possibly do that? The way that we can do it is by having all of you be our partners, because we're gonna be bringing in the most important thing in patient safety. We're bringing in the patient because we have heard it over and over again that patients want to be part of the healthcare decision making. Patients want to be able to be an active participant in their own health. And the only way we can do that is to bring patients in from the very beginning. So we're going to be sharing some innovative solutions for patients to have that opportunity to be an active participant. So again, September 17th, yes, Patient Safety Day but it also will be the launch for Strong Start and Beyond. And going forward as part of just um, not only including patients, we're gonna be focusing on the most common cause of death in California, and that's having to do with cardiovascular disease. And that's where the tech comes in, because we know that there is remote monitoring, we know that there is monitoring that can be done at home, information that can be shared, more importantly, we can teach patients how to be advocates and how to be able to use some of these resources. So all of you have those solutions. I know many of you may already be working on cardiovascular programs. Please reach out and share them with us because we want to elevate that work. The whole purpose of Strong Start and Beyond is not to create something new. The purpose is to break down the silos because everyone is doing such an amazing job at what you're doing. But now imagine if we bring all of those efforts together and we share it with the entire population of California, we're gonna change the world. And I do mean the world because California does lead innovation on all levels. And we know that what, as California goes, so does the rest of the nation. But more importantly, so does the world, because California has been such an innovator that everyone around the globe looks to us for our leadership and for our innovation. So please help me be part of that innovation. Be our partners. Join our Strong Start and Beyond. Pledge to be a supporter, because only together can we achieve amazing and audacious goals. And so with that, I thank you so much for your time and for your opportunity, for the opportunity to share 
remember the most compo important component in patient safety is the patient. Use technology to be part, uh, to be an extension of all of the team. And remember to please partner with us. Thank you so much. Have an amazing conference.